if when I stand here at this time and say to you, the Lord's church is different for people in this congregation, that is not going to be a jarring statement. But if you were to go around through the various congregations of God's people, and more especially among the denominations, they might not really what you know what you mean. Do you mean you're different because you wear different kinds of clothes or anybody else that says they're a believer in Christ or some such thing like that? And, of course, not everyone is happy with the fact, and I say it is a fact, that the Lord's church is different. Most people understand the church erroneously because they see it only as a sectarian denominational institution. That the church has really nothing to do with your salvation. That actually one is saved by his personal belief in Christ without anything else. And then you just pick the church of your choice so you can associate with those who think and believe things pretty much as you do. The denominations used to be much more distinct between one another than they are now. Back in the days of the early part of the 19th century when the first great efforts were made to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity, then the denominations were very different. And they did not really, I guess you'd say, have much to do with one another. They had their given catechisms and creeds, prayer books and manuals. And uh, if you were a Methodist, it was because you lived by the Methodist discipline. Of course, the Methodists believed that discipline set out what the Bible teaches. But if you were a Baptist, you had a Baptist manual. Somebody else might have some sort of catechism, somebody else might have some sort of prayer book, but those set out the distinctiveness that separated the churches from one another. And yet they would still say that, well, the one church exists, but it's a great invisible universal body made up of all of the different denominations. Well, as the restoration movement began, it started with the idea that how is it we only have one God and one Savior and one Bible, and yet we have all these different churches? What's keeping us apart? We all say Christ is our Savior. We worship the same God. Why is it that we all can't assemble together and be just uh, at one with one another? And, of course, they concluded that, well, We've all got to settle on one standard to determine what's right and wrong. And thus, it began to be advocated that we take the Bible, and the Bible only, as our only rule of faith and practice. And that started the ball rolling. It didn't take long because people understood and studied. For them to read the Bible and understand those particular points that set the Lord's church apart from churches built and sustained on the commandments and doctrines of men. There still may be that there are those who really don't understand that the Lord's church was built by Jesus Christ. He promised to build it in Matthew 16, 18. And even though they may read that statement, upon this rock I will build my church, they may never give it really any thought as to what that implies about a multiplicity of churches with different organizations and different ways of even being saved. In recent years, I would say since World War II and especially since the 1960s, all of that's been blurred even more between the denominations because people in denominationalism don't really know much about what the church of which they are part believes and even what it means to denominate or why they were ever called denominations. 
if they would just simply read their Bible saying this is the word of God. It's the only true source book to understand what Christianity is. Then that would be a great start. But we can't even get our own brethren to read the Bible like they ought to. As a rule, I speak in generalities. They don't realize that if they read that, they would see in Acts chapter 2 that the Lord builds his church on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. Now, according to the calendar you use, that's going to be either A.D. 30 or A.D. 33. But that makes no difference. It was founded on that first Pentecost in Jerusalem after the resurrection and ascension of Christ. And you can read how it happened in Acts chapter 2. They also, as Peter's sermon shows, and as other places in the New Testament teaches, quoted from the prophets often to show Christ was the Son of God and to show that there would be the house of God and that that house of God was the, and is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, Isaiah 2, 2, and 3. And Michael virtually said the same thing as Isaiah did in Micah 4, 1 through 2 that in the last days God would set up his house. Daniel 2.44 makes it clear that he would set up a kingdom, the kingdom and the house of God, the fa family of God, are used interchangeably. They're one and the same institution. And thus the prophets prophesied of all of that happening in the early church since the New Testament was not fully revealed, then preached as the Holy Spirit guided them the truth of the gospel concerning the identifying marks of the church that our Lord built and purchased with his blood, Acts 20, verse 28. And the inspired apostle Paul in his writings of the New Testament makes it abundantly clear that Jesus Christ, the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Some denominations will say, well, there is the body of Christ. What they mean by that, that one invisible universal body made up of all the differing denominations. But there were no denominations as Protestant denominationalism has been known for the last virtually 500 years. These churches are too late to be the church that Jesus built. Jesus built it. If it has anybody else that built it, it's certainly not the Lord's church. So Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, part of a letter written to the church in Ephesus of Asia, makes it clear that Christ is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. So the church is his body. Can language be clearer? If I'm to let the Bible form my views of the distinctiveness of the church, then I know the church is his body because that's what it says. If I take a position that says the church is not his body, I speak diametrically contrary and to uh, Paul's own writing. If I can do that with that verse, I can do it with any verse. So why even uh, pick up the Bible if that's the way you treat it? You're going to do what you want to do in the first place. But the denominations are not happy when you begin to say there's only one church and its identifying marks are set out in the New Testament of the Christ. But an even sadder thing is the truth that not all members of the Lord's church are happy that the Lord's church is different from all other religious institutions. All my preaching life, which started in 1965, I've seen those and experienced them more and more every year who say, well, we want to be like the nations round about us, speaking of the spiritual denominational churches founded by men upon their commandments and doctrines. I've had very close friends, starting from those that I was with in high school, who did not want to say that the church that Jesus built and purchased with his blood, to which he adds all the saved, was the church. They wanted to try to figure out how to include other folks in the church that believed in Christ as the Son of God. But that just can't be if the Bible's the Word of God, and it is, and it will judge us all on the last day, John 12, 48. And it reads and means now why, how it will read and, read and mean then. The goal of many who profess to be Christians is to extend the open arms of fellowship to anyone who claims to be a believer in the deity of Christ. 
Now, I realize that some people may not read as far and wide as some of us have and over a period of many, many years to read a lot of this stuff, but it's out there. In the last 10 years or maybe 20 or so, there's been a lot less writing, a lot less material that dealt with those things as there was from about 1960 some odd until probably 15 years ago. And nowadays people just aren't really being interested in what does the Bible teach? If it teaches this, what does that mean to me and what I believe and what I do and who I fellowship and who I don't? So these who are eager to loose where God is not loosed, that is, God is bound upon us what we're to do by the authoritative word, well, they're interested in loosing us from what God has obligated us to do. And yet we find that the Lord himself has already bound and loosed in heaven over 2,000 years ago the truth of God and revealed it by the Holy Spirit. And the apostles only could loose what Christ had loosed and only could bind what Christ had bound. And the Holy Spirit in revealing the New Testament guided them infallibly to write those things as they were. And thus we dare not add to or subtract from or alter in any way the word of God. Our duty is to be sure we know how to ascertain the authority of he who we call king and who is king, uh, the only Lord and of lords and king of kings, our Savior, and there is none other. So there are those in the church who are not impressed with the distinctiveness of the Lord's church and their goal and continues to be their goal, and they make great headway, make great headway in the church to compromise and change to the point that churches of Christ cannot be distinguished from any denomination. And I realize that most people know about the church only so far as they know about the congregation where they are. Well, if you don't pay attention or have any way of finding out what's going on, then you're liable to wake up one day and things really be changed around. But again, you would have the wherewithal to distinguish the difference if you really studied the Bible and evaluated everything of the light of the right and divided word. This blending and mixing of religion is what many of these people in the church allege that the Lord had in mind for his followers. And so they've tried to reshape even history of the early 19th century with the beginning of the restoration movement by saying their, their real move was unity and not to settle on the final authority of what we're to go by. Well, that's just not the case. It is true they wanted to be one, but they realized they could not be one or be unified if they did not have a proper standard of authority that they can all agree upon to go by. You could desire to measure a bolt of cloth, but if you didn't have a standard everybody accepted, how would you know whether you got a foot of it or whether you got 15 feet of it? Well, you say, I can see one's longer than the other. Well, if you don't know what foot or feet is and have a standard of measurement, you just know that you've got one longer than the other. How do you tell them how much you want? You have no way of doing it. And so it is when it comes to what's right or wrong with God. What do we do that's right? What do we leave undone that we shouldn't do that God doesn't want us to do? Well, if you don't have a standard, there's no way to know it. There is a way that seems right to a man, the Old Testament writer said, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So there's an ever-growing people who really don't believe, and I'm talking about members of the church, over the years who really don't believe God means what he says and says what he means in the Bible. They see all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Truly furnished into every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And frankly, they don't believe it. They read of the perfect law of liberty in James 1, 25 and still deny the New Testament's a law. And there it says it is. So you say, well, how did all this begin? Just where it began in fleshly Israel of old. 
Go back and read how they departed even after they left Egypt. They just did not believe Moses. They believed something else. They didn't want to follow Moses. They even tried to usurp Moses after they had seen all they saw in the land of Egypt and how he delivered them. But they still didn't want to do what Moses said, which was the will of God for Israel, especially once God, through Moses, had given the law of Moses. So there's this ever-growing number of people who are quick to allege what they believe, what they believe, I say, but they are arrogantly adamant at not desiring to prove their allegations or to even say the Bible is a book whereby you can prove anything to be right. And yet the Bible says prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. He didn't say prove some things. He said prove all things. Now there's nothing left out relative to the context of what he's talking about. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 And the Bible still teaches, Beloved, believe not every spirit. That's addressed to Christians, to members of the church. Don't believe every spirit. Well, you hear some people and you'll just believe everything. He says, what do you do? Well, he says, prove the spirits to see whether they be of God. For many false prophets are gone out into the world, 1 John 4, 1. It's amazing to me that even while the New Testament was being written and the apostles walked this earth, that they're telling us that even then there are many spirits, as it were, false teachers out there claiming to teach you what God wants you to do. You have the obligation to yourself and to God to find out whether they're telling the truth. How do you do that without the Word of God? How do you do it? So we see that God's Word is truth. We see that we're to walk in the truth as we continue in the Word, John 8, 31 and 32. And that's the only way you're going to be able to distinguish truth from error. Of course, you've got a lot of folks that are claiming that there's not any difference, really, truth and error. There's just your truth and my truth and his truth and her truth and their truth. But you can never say a person is in error. I guarantee you that if you were to be in a number of congregations in this land of the Lord's people tonight, and you were to say that what you're doing, and it, of course, if it were error, is in error, and they would think you're just a picky person, you're just a contentious person. You just want to cause problems. Well, they forget everything that's been set out as object lessons in the Old Testament concerning truth and righteousness, men standing for the truth and opposing error, and everything taught in the New Testament. I think there are three scriptures, you might think of others, three scriptures that will suffice to prove, of course, for those who believe the Bible to be the Word of God, that the Lord does not intend for His church to blend in or be a part of man-made churches that started on the basis of the commandments and doctrines of men and are sustained such as they can be thereby. First, Jesus prayed that there be unity and not division in religious convictions. I don't know how much clearer the Master's words could be then when in prayer he said, Neither for these only do I pray, that's the apostles, but for them also that believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe that thou didn't send me. John 17, 20 and 21. Now, Denominationalism does nothing more than present confusion to an unbelieving world. It simply says that you people can't get it all straight among yourselves. You claim to worship God and His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior, and yet you're all going every different direction and claiming each other's wrong. And I've had a number of people, in, especially my younger years when I was in college, take issue with me over that point. You say, well, you wouldn't be what you are except that you were raised in a home that would members of the Church of Christ. That's just not the case. If you look back in the days when I grew up, so many people who were members of the Church of Christ were converted out of denominations. 
because they saw the denominations were not supported by the gospel of Christ. They understood they were not authorized, and they saw the truth of the gospel and the oneness of the Lord's church and its identifying marks in the scriptures. Next of all, you're all familiar with this, that the inspired apostle Paul said this, Now I beseech you, brethren, through the name or by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Just think about that for a minute. Every member of the church is to speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1.10. I promise you there are churches of Christ, at least that's still above the door on the marquee, to where you won't hear that preached anymore unless it's to try to make it say something it doesn't. So this is one of those, if you take it for what it says, unget overable and unget aroundable verses of Scripture that many just prefer to ignore or pretend it's not in their Bible or to try to explain it away. And third, the Holy Scriptures declare be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Or what communion hath light with darkness? Or what fellowship hath a righteousness and iniquity? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what portion hath a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. That we was the apostle and the Lord's church that he was addressing there. The church of Christ is that term he's used in the scriptures. And there are the terms that are scriptural. He's talking about the church Jesus built. He's talking about the family of God. He's talking about the institution composing the saved. We are the temple of the living God even as God said, I will dwell in them and will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then notice this. Wherefore come ye out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. 2 Corinthians six fourteen through 17. Now that means something. There's a message in that for the church. I want to know, first of all, what it meant to the church at Corinth. Well, it's true, denominationalism didn't exist then, but they certainly had idolatrous business going on. And they had the Jews there who were not believers in Christ. And whatever was contrary to Christ and his will, whatever went against the doctrine of Christ, Paul is simply saying, don't be a part of it. Now somebody says, well, how do you teach the gospel to people if you can't be around them? That's not what he has in mind. He makes it clear that he's talking about an association with them that condones their activity and approves of it. That's why he would say that evil companionship corrupts good morals. And yet he would say to get completely away from worldly things, you'd have to leave the world. He's trying to explain to them, I'm not talking about in the workplace and in the school and your neighbors. You can't get away from the world that way. But you don't have to be so close to it that you party with them, that they rub off on you. And so it is when it comes to anything like that. I found a long time ago, as just a teenager, that those who seemed to be interested in religious things I didn't have a problem with them at all regardless of what they were doing. If they started some of their worldly business, I would just start inviting them to Bible studies. Start talking to them about coming to Bible uh, classes and start inviting them to church. You know, when people want to be worldly, they don't like to hear that. Or if there is something about them that says, I need to be paying attention to spiritual things, you'll find out. But one thing you will do is that you'll separate yourself from them and they'll know the difference. Now, you can't do that and not live right. I know that, but what I just said is a part of living right. I don't know what's happened that we think we can just be like the world. So you've got some churches right now 
that they do what they call their bar church or saloon church or whatever they call it. One of them is up there in uh, West Monroe, Louisiana, where they've got, uh, what's that bunch name up there? Huh? Well, the Duck Dynasty family, and that's what they do. One of them goes over to a bar, and they set their beer and whatever's going on, and they have Bible studies. <laughs> you know, sometimes ignorance and stupidity just goes to seed. That's all there is to it. I remember, because Camden, where I grew up, Arkansas, is not hardly 100 miles from Monroe. I remember growing up back when I was in junior high and high school, they put on a Bible program called Let the Bible Speak out of El Dorado. That's the way you pronounce it up there, El Dorado, Arkansas. And it was a very good one because they had a school of preaching there that was quite sound in the 60s. And the people would be on there and they would take the questions from the community and then answer them with the Bible. They did a very good job. Well, those people in those days wouldn't even recognize that church. It's up there now that used to sponsor and be a part of that. That's how much it's changed, and we're talking about it in about 50 years. So I've lived long enough to see these ha things happen and watch them basically be faithful and over a period of time just completely fall apart to become basically like the denominations round about them. The principle that's contained in the passage I just gave you from 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17 is, an, let's just call it an eternal principle. That's what it is. It's eternal as far as a, a time that it never applied. That same sentiment applied to the Jews of old under the law of Moses, and it always has applied to God's people. All you've got to do is to go back to the patriarchal age and see how Abraham conducted himself. And you'll see that it will still come you out from among them and be you separate and touch not the unclean thing. And you see that same principle among the Jews. So they kept the law it kept them separate from all the other nations. And the same is true in our conduct today as far as individual Christians, wherever we are and whatever we do, and then the church as a whole. So this is a call for God's people to be separate, to be unique, to be distinct from the world and world, worldly man-made religions. I don't see why that is so hard to understand. There was a time that men did understand that, and thus the church came into existence because the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, was taken for what it was, Luke 8, 11, and sown in the hearts of, that were good and honest, Luke 8, 15, and what came forth? Christians and Christians only, members of the church that Jesus built. The battle with Satan begins with the mind. I've said that a lot lately. I've said it all my life. It's true. You as an individual must know that. Where do you let your thoughts go? Do you have a disciplined mind? Is your mind so programmed with the truth of God's word as to how you ought to live that if something crosses it that's contrary to it, you catch it? And you ask God for forgiveness. Is that your attitude? It ought to be. If ye then be risen with Christ, together with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections, which means your mind, on the things that are above and not on the things upon the earth. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Why most of us aren't much different than everybody else, we're thinking about everything goes on here. Well, how do you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and have that go on? When he wrote this in Colossians 3, 1 and 2 to members of the church on how to stay faithful and grow in Christ. It's impossible for one to succumb to the politically correct thinking that goes on and live the Christian life as it's set out on the pages of the New Testament. The truth of the matter is that distinctive and unique thinking is the only thing that will lead to distinctive and unique living. That shouldn't be hard to understand. It would be well for all of us to remember that if the gospel is veiled, it's because, now listen how Paul put it, 
the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn or shine upon them. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. How does that happen? How does the world, the God of this world, blind people, even certain members of the church, to the truth? Well, when you're interested in the sensual things, the fleshly things, those are more important than the study of the Bible and what it teaches. You won't see what's in the Bible. It's not because you don't have the intellectual capacity to see it. It's because these other things are more important to you than what the Bible says. That's exactly how it happens. And if those things are more important to you, what's going to make you see what the Bible has for you to see. That's why the Lord talked much about the person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness being the person who will be filled. There must be that desire to please God. And if it's not there and you love this present world, which means you care about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, or things as they're just done here in this world, you're not going to have to be much in the church if you even Pay attention to the gospel and obey it. One who so desires can know the truth. They can know it because they can know the word of God. And God made them to be able to know it. And that truth can free that person from the bondage of sin. That's the very point Jesus made. We referred to it already in John 8, 31 and 32. The Bible unashamedly declares that there is only one body. Dare I say that there's more than one body acceptable to God? That there's one spirit. Dare I say there's more than one Holy Spirit? There's one hope. And so on down the line. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God. And Father of all. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. God's will has always been distinctive. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. And neither are our ways his ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. We have to learn his ways from his word. And we have to then live according to them. I don't know why it's so hard for a person in denominationalism to see that there's one faith. You ever had people ask you, well, of what faith are you? Well, you can just confuse them to death by saying, well, I'm of the faith. It's recorded on the pages of the New Testament. Yeah, but I mean, what church are you a member? Well, I'm a member of the church that Jesus built. Well, which church is that? It's the one that he purchased with his blood. Yeah, but what is that church? One that was founded on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. You see, they're so hemmed in by that narrow human concept that's false of the church. They can't even think like the Bible thinks of the church. And the Lord's church is put here to teach the truth and that means the truth of the church and the oneness of the church and the uniqueness of the Lord's church. A faithful child of God will always rejoice in the truth that the Lord's church is distinctive, it's different, and it's unique. I'm not talking about, as I close, just being different for the sake of being different. I'm talking about in doing God's will you will automatically be different from those who live according to the commandments and doctrines of men. A faithful child of God is never going, never going to compromise or apologize for the church of our Lord or the glorious truths God expects it to preach and to live in our individual lives. So I end where I started that the Lord's church is different. It's different because it follows the truth of the Bible in every way. The Lord did not want the church to be mostly guided by the truth or halfway guided by the truth. I remember years ago when they were talking about, this is 50 years ago, at the old Fried Hardeman lectures in the open forum, they were talking about using denominational preachers to teach on things whereby they would teach what the Bible said. 
they understood that. Does that mean there was no gospel preaching in the church that couldn't preach on it? But that shows you that spirit of compromise that started showing up. And somebody was trying to justify doing that kind of thing. And Brother Woods pointed out, he said, well, I'm sure that you could go to Presbyterian or Baptist or Methodist and on certain topics, if they stayed with that topic, you would hear some good lessons. But then you've got to realize on all these other things, they're in error. Now, it's not our desire to have just some truth mixed with error. It's the desire of the faithful child of God and members of the church that Jesus built to want truth, truth, truth in all things. And to say that now, people almost think you're goofy. Do you mean to tell me you know the truth? On those essentials pertaining to what must I do to be saved from my sins and to be faithful in the Lord's church to which he added me when I was baptized? Yes. You can know all that God wants you to know and you need to know to become a Christian and be faithful to God in the church. Whatever's binding on us to be faithful in the church, every item you can grow in. You can grow in your worship, which is obligatory. You can grow in every part of the worship, singing, praying, etc. But you're doing it all the time. It's the nature of what we do as Christians in the church that we would grow in it. Or else, how do you change from a babe in Christ to taking a milk, as it were, to use the illustration of the Bible, and grow to a mature person who's able to eat meat? That's the very point. Get it in your minds. Everything God enjoins upon us, it's obligatory to be faithful as Christians. You can grow and develop in. So I hope my worship today is better than it was 15, 20, 30 years ago because I've changed it. No, because of my growth and understanding what it is to be a Christian, I see far more in it. But it's the same thing. That's the reasons I've said many times when you read your Bible, maybe you memorized a passage and you studied it many times over the past 50, 60 years, and then all of a sudden you see something you didn't see before. Well, the Bible hadn't changed. Guess what changed? What needed to change? You. That's what living the Christian life is. Changing to be in the likeness of Christ by doing the things the Testament joins upon us to be faithful to Him. If you're not a child of God today, we've studied what to do to become one. And as a child of God, if you're not faithful or you've been overtaken in a trespass, your duty then to God is to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. And we give you this opportunity to do that while we stand and sing.